I don't say a word until he tells me I can. <laughs> Greetings. Welcome to the sixth session of the second season of Stories to Share. My name is Joe Steinfield, and I am the moderator of this series. And today's speaker is a most interesting person, as I think most of you know. She is a New Englander by birth, grew up in the Boston area. She went to college at UMass. Long time later, she got a degree in religious studies at the University of Hartford. She is now a longtime resident of Jaffa. Uh, those of you who may be here for the first time should know that this series features people who are from this region. And somebody asked me, well, aren't you concerned you're going to run out of people? <laughs> and I said, not a bit, no problem. Well, our speaker is more than a local person, more than a New Englander, but really a woman of the world. She graduated from college and then spent 29 years in the military. 26. <laughs> Only 26. <laughs> that is the first of many mistakes I will make today. <laughs> then she became an interfaith minister, a counselor, and this part you didn't tell me, somebody else did. A wicked tennis player. Well, her parents were born in Poland. One in a larger city, one in a small town. And what she has done, as you can see from the title of today's talk, is gone full circle. And I suspect you all know that her mission, or one of her missions now, has to do with Ukrainian refugees coming into Poland, where she has been several times and where she will be going within the next few weeks once again. And if you ask her, well, what are you going to do when you get there? You get a wonderful answer. Well, I'll look around. I'll see what needs to be done. I think actually she has more in mind than that, but she is, among other things, a modest person. And we're lucky that she's one of us. So Ilona Kvichin, yes, I've been practicing. I want to get it right. Ilona Kvichin, welcome to Stories to Share. You certainly have stories to share. I'm happy to introduce you. I am a little overwhelmed. Um, thank you very much for those kind words and thank you for the opportunity to share uh, my story. I must say, when I first started thinking about this, I said, how am I going to talk for about an hour? I don't know. I mean, I've given sermons. I've given speeches. Um, you don't want to go more than 20 minutes on those because people will start leaving. Uh, but anyway, at this point, I hope I don't overextend by too much and I don't get the big hook yanking me out of here. But again, thank you very much for this opportunity. So full circle from refugee to refugee support. And there are a few other smaller circles that I'm going to kind of briefly mention in between. It occurred to me that by my going to Poland after Ukraine was invaded, I had come full circle. My parents, and by the way, my brother and sister-in-law and in the audience, George and Sandy here. So my parents, our parents, <clears throat> were refugees from Poland following World War II and came to the United States via Germany uh, with little old me. I think maybe I was about this high. 
And here I was going back uh, to their home country 71 years later to help refugees there. It's really a sad statement that this needed to be done. So I hope to share the stories of this circle today. Uh, my parents' uh, refugee experience, my time in the army and how that is part of this circle. Some lessons learned from my time as chaplain after retiring from the army and what I saw and did during my three trips to Poland last year. As you may pick up along the way, not all of it came about as planned. So uh, this is just a symbol of Polish-Ukrainian friendship. It's a slide that appeared at a concert I was privileged to go to my last day in Lublin, this last time I went. Um, many Poles opened their hearts when the refugee influx came in and I was very touched by everything I saw. Many small people in many small places doing many small things can change the face of the earth. This is a saying I love. It was graffiti on the Berlin Wall, so I was told. And this is a lot of what I witnessed in Poland. People were doing all kinds of things to be able to help from driving people to bringing food to clothing, you name it. And there were so many people of goodwill. There are many examples of people of goodwill throughout the world. And here in Jaffrey, I don't think you're gonna run out of people, uh, Joe, <laughs> anytime soon here in Jaffrey, or for that matter in the Monadnock region. And I know for a fact there are other people doing things for Ukraine here. I'm just one of many small people doing what I can based on my particular skills, the languages I have, my experiences, knowledge of the countries and some of my connections. So here we go with the story. That's my parents on the left, their wedding day, 1949, and them 50 years later uh, on their wedding, um, 50th anniversary of their wedding. Now, mom and dad, as Joe said, came from different parts of Poland, city girl, country boy. They probably would never have met in Poland but they both became refugees in Germany and met at a displaced person camp. Uh, they got to Germany via different methods, well, different ways. Uh, my dad was taken in 1943, I think he was 17 years old then, uh, for forced labor in Germany. He didn't get to say goodbye to his family uh, and ended up working in Munich for a fellow who had a farm and a coal business. My mom and her sister, Amanda, towards the end of the war, rode their bikes ahead of the Soviet forces uh, to get into the American sector because of what the Soviet forces uh, were prone to do to women. So that's a little bit of their story. Now, this is a copy of my mom's refugee registration. When my brother and I were going through my parents' house before we sold it, they en ended up retiring in Florida. We came across a whole bunch of documents we didn't know existed. And my parents didn't really talk all that much about their experiences, just, just a little bit. So this has basic information about my mom. You gotta love that hairdo. We were trying to figure out if that was a hat, but I'm not, I'm not sure. This is um, a Nazi document, as you can tell. This is what my dad was issued when he was forced to work for this guy. It's the Arbeitsbuch für Ausländer, a workbook for foreigners. You can see he doesn't look like a very happy young man here. There are only two entries in this book. One entry is, was when he started working for the fellow that he was assigned to. And the other is when the American forces liberated Munich uh, in, 19, in 1945. So a couple of years later, those are the only two entries in this book. This is some of the work history. They ended up in Bremen at Camp Gron. Um, on the right is sort of a work record of my dad. Uh, he was a security guard, ended up being a chief guard. He was an interpreter and inspector. It kind of synopsizes that. To the left is a German document that my mom was issued depicting you know, what she made, some tax information, and we found this Allied Expeditionary Force Index card. We're not sure exactly what that was issued for, but that was also in her name. Now, this is one of those little circles that I mentioned. 
My dad was a security guard. I ended up as a military police officer to begin with in the Army. More on that later. This is a picture of my dad. And this is him leading, carrying the flag, uh, leading. It was either probably going to raise the flag or having lowered the flag. He was very proud of that picture. This is my dad and his buddies chilling. He looks much happier here. Uh, the young man in the middle kind of sitting down, sort of squatting. Uh, they kept in touch with him and his wife. I think they moved to Connecticut. So uh, that's them at Camp Groen. Now, <clears throat> they knew they didn't want to stay in Germany, so they started applying to come, to, to move, to emigrate. Uh, the story goes, my dad wanted to go to Australia. My mom wanted to come here. My mom prevailed, as she often did. <laughs> I could have been standing here talking to you with an Aussie accent, but I'm not. Um, Along the, lots of documents uh, along the way to emigrate. These are just two good conduct statements for my dad. Two different bosses. Uh, the one on the right was a colonel, and a little bit more about him in, in a few minutes. This is a letter of acceptance dated June 1950 that uh, they had been cleared to come to the United States. There are a whole bunch of other documents along the way some in Polish, some in English, uh, but this was the letter of acceptance, June 1950. However, I came around in August of 1950, and I was told I kind of gummed up the works because they had to start all over with my paperwork. I don't know if they were looking for good conduct statements or not at that point, but it wasn't until uh, October of 1951 that we all actually came to the United States. And back in that time, you had to have a sponsor, you had to have a guarantee of housing and a job. Before um, they left, this is the colonel that I mentioned. Uh, they called him Uncle Piotrusz, um, Uncle Peter. And he wrote, he, I, my dad worked for him, and he wrote these words. I don't think you can read it, so I, I'd like to read you these words that he wrote. With this photo, I would like to thank you for all your loyalty, I'm gonna <clears throat> take a deep breath, for all your loyalty, friendship, and valuable service you have done for me. May you in your new country find freedom and many new good friends. I wish for you and Krisha and your child all the best of good luck, good health, and a very happy and successful future. Goodbye for now. Someday we may meet again. So until then, do your best for your new country as you did for me. <clears throat> Yours truly, Uncle Piotrus. And they did meet. He retired in New Jersey and my parents were able to visit him a few times. They kept in touch. So this is, as I view it, kind of another smaller circle. He helped my parents a lot to include making sure they had a honeymoon and I had many other things. So he was a colonel in the army. Here I was, a, am a retired colonel going back to their home country to help other refugees. It's kind of mind-boggling, actually. So, here we are on our way. This is the USS Hersey. It was a destroyer, I believe, converted to carrying refugees back to the United States. That's the manifest. Our names are on there. I don't know if you can find them, uh, but they are, to include me. And they, um, <clears throat> I'm told that my dad was sick the entire trip. <laughs> Mom had a little cabin uh, because because I was around, so she was entitled to a cabin. So I made up for the sort of mucking up things a little bit earlier. So we ended up via New York and South Boston. Ultimately, we moved to Melrose. I'd like to show you a few documents of what they kept um, in their process for citizenship. As you can read on the right, the questions and answers. On the left is are the words to the Star Spangled Banner and God Bless America. They kept it all these years. Obviously, it meant um, a lot to them. They loved Poland and they loved their adopted country. So a couple stories about English. They had to learn English. The saying on the top comes from a list that we found of uh, tongue twisters. 
I have trouble with this one myself. The sea ceaseth and it sufficeth us. I don't know if they got that completely or not, um, but we had a whole list of these. I chose, I chose to show you this one. Another story, when they first arrived, um, there was a little grocery store where they lived and my mom saw the sign P-I-E-S. We know that means pies. In Polish, it means dog. So having so seeing this sign, she was a little befuddled about why the heck they would be selling dogs in a food store. And one of those small people, a woman who helped our family a lot, took her back to that store and said, look, this is what this is. It's not, it's not a dog. So, and many refugees have these kinds of stories. It's, it's a learning experience and you need people to help you through it. So they worked hard. This uh, mom um, started off as a cleaning lady at the, the old Hancock building in Boston, worked her way up to file clerk and then an adjuster for insurance. Uh, this is her learning, I guess, about auto mechanics. Look at the clean uh, white coats. I don't think they went under the cars <laughs> on that. Uh, my dad went back to school, uh, Northeastern University, got a degree in engineering and became an electrical engineer working for a number of um, firms. So they started with nothing and were very, very grateful for all and appreciated the help that they received. They, like I said, it's typical of refugees and they gave back in turn once they got on their feet. They also played hard. This is a group of their friends. Uh, George and I kind of dubbed them at some point uh, the Polish mafia, I don't know why. <laughs> but. All of these people were, well, pretty much, I'm pretty sure almost everyone here was a refugee with their own story um, from World War II. They took, they loved life, they lived it to the fullest, they took every opportunity to have a good time in between things that they had to do. And that's a lesson, I think, for us all is to appreciate life uh, to the fullest as we can. Poland kept calling. Um, they couldn't go back to Poland, it was communist, until they got citizenship, uh, which took until I was in the third grade, and I got my citizenship from my parents once they got theirs. Um, I still remember that day, I went before this kindly old, and I use the term loosely now, <laughs> he, he might have been in his 50s, I'm not sure, I laugh at that now, but uh, he was a very kindly man. He threw me a few softball questions, like who was the first president, and then took me aside and talked to me, a language I could understand about what this meant, what I was doing today, what citizenship meant. Um, it's, uh, obviously, it resonates in my heart still today. So once we all got our, and then my brother uh, was a citizenship citizen. He was a citizen here because he was born in Boston, which whenever we played war was a point of contention between us. <laughs> in any case, they, say, they had to save up uh, and off we went to Poland for a whole summer in 1959. They left $100 with their landlord, it took courage, uh, had no guarantee about a job coming back, but they had to go back to see family and friends that they hadn't seen. And at this point, I'd like to read you, I'm, I could go on and on about the stories from that summer, but there is one moment that has resonated in my heart forever. I can't let go of it. It's when my dad, when we went to visit my grandmother, my dad's dad. And I tried to capture this moment um, for a while, and finally about uh, eight years ago, this poem came to me. Uh, my dad was usually, uh, doesn't show much emotion, um, but we arrived in Poland, were taken to one uncles who lived in a fairly large city. My grandmother lived way out in the country. We boarded a wagon and two horses, Maciej and Dudek, I still remember their names. And off we went to my grandmother's into the country. We rounded a corner and my dad jumped off the moving wagon, ran to a gaggle of people we had seen up ahead. And the next thing you see is someone being twirled in the air. And this is my poem, if I can get through it, uh, I do need a drink of something. It's not vodka. It's called The Whirl. Skirt billowing, a petite woman picked up and spun after 16 years of separation from her oldest son. 
Lives disrupted by a war, ach, the havoc they've done. The sun outraced two horses those last 50 yards, joy and sorrow dancing together in everyone's hearts. The embrace, then the lift, the spin, the twirl. Were words spoken? Ah, no, it was all in that whirl. What of the war's impact, all those lost years, the tragedies, the bombs, the ever-present fears? Oh, they no doubt lingered, and yes, there were tears. But came the embrace, the lift, the spin, the twirl, in that moment all put away, gone in that whirl. A wife and two young children caught up from behind, absorbed into a loving, chaotic circle, one of a kind. A family reunited, a full summer still in store. The farm, the cherries, cows, chickens, and so much more. So many memories in the making for a young boy and girl, all captured first and foremost in that unforgettable world. <clears throat> Since then, the wars continue, both big and small. Would that a wondrous world could put an end to them all. And that is, I'm sure we all carry in our hearts. <clears throat> So then I joined the army. <laughs> um, I wanted the Navy, actually, when we, my roommate and I started investigating, but the Navy wasn't allowing women on ships, so I said, what's the point? <laughs> so uh, my roommate and I both joined the army. Now, at the time, there weren't many paths available for women to become officers. Uh, we ended up attending an 18-week women's officer basic course. Uh, there was no ROTC, there was no West Point, none of that was available. And ROTC did not invite the two of us to take the oath of office along with the ROTC cadets then. So uh, after the graduation festivities, we came home, and this is Mr. Wright. He was a retired lieutenant colonel. I asked him to give me my oath of office, and, and he didn't. So just a couple, I couldn't resist, just a couple of pictures uh, from basic training. We fondly called it Wopsy. Uh, this is sort of my gang that I hang ar hung around with um, in our fatigues. And then that's on graduation day with a couple of friends. <clears throat> from there, I became an MP. Now, that was not according to plan. I mentioned not much of this was according to plan. Um, <coughs> as... I was with the first group of women who were detailed to other branches, which means um, like engineers signal, not just in the Women's Army Corps. We were given some choices and I wanted to be intelligence because I thought, well, with my language skills, that would be a good mix, good fit. And I was fat, dumb and happy for a while until about a week before we graduated when my platoon leader called me in and said, uh, military intelligence is military intelligence isn't going to take you, you have relatives in Poland, the security clearance is going to take way too long, so what else do you want? And I said, can I think about it? And she said, no, You're not. <laughs> I need an answer now. So I had a friend who was going into the MP, she was all excited, I said, how about MPs? And the rest is history, as they say. So these are just two photos from that time. Uh, I was company commander in the upper picture, I, I think the young man, uh, the specialist, re-enlisted. I was congratulating him on the bottom there. I was a platoon leader in Germany. I was the liaison officer to the German uh, military police, Feldjäger Battalion. We were at some joint exercise and I'm handing him a gift from our, from our company. So then um, every officer has to get a second specialty roughly midway between and it's another many stories here but I finally became a foreign area officer specializing in the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union. Um, there I had a series of assignments. T technically, you were supposed to go back and forth to your original branch. I knew I didn't want to do that. That lowered my promotion chances. I didn't care. I really loved my foreign area officer work. Uh, I first got a job working with um, debriefers in Munich. Uh, we debrief people who came into the West from Soviet Union, Warsaw Pact, and a few other countries. It was a great job, lots of emigres, also from the, after World War II who loved their country. I was the operations officer, and we actually came under the operational control of the CIA. I can tell you that now. I couldn't before without shooting you. So, 
So uh, then I went to the Pentagon Joint Staff for Intelligence and then to Moscow as Assistant Army Attaché and then to Ukraine as Army Attaché. The Pentagon was a crazy time in the Joint Intelligence Staff. Warsaw Pact disintegrated, the Soviet Union split apart, we had the Pan Panama Canal invasion, we had the Yugoslav War, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, a few other crises uh, rolled in between all of that. I could go on and on. I just wanted to share a couple personal highlights from that time. When the Warsaw Pact came apart, um, the intelligence community didn't really know what to do with it because all the East European countries were like, oh, that's the Warsaw Pact. And suddenly we had to convince everyone who was making decisions uh, that you can't treat them all as one lump group. They ha you have to treat them as an individual country because they are all different. Poland, as soon as they could, started um, well, agitating or started pushing to come closer to the United States. I was involved in some of that. Uh, and I was fortunate to be able to go on one of the very first, maybe it was the first exchange uh, where the US military went to Poland uh, was a group of historians. They figured that was a safe topic for discussion of history at that point. We were just getting to know each other. And here we are laying the wreath at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. The Poles couldn't do enough. We had many toasts to both countries, a lot of late night discussions. Um, they were showing us off. The gentleman to my right, I was in the back row. He yanked me to the front because he wanted me to be in the front. It was a very moving moment for me after all those years. The other nice thing that happened, <laughs> I like that happened, I got promoted to Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, my parents, this was the only time my parents could actually come to one of my promotions, they pinned me. And honestly, I thought at this point, okay, this is it, I'm not going any further, I'm gonna retire in two years, which I was gonna reach the 20 year mark, and that would be it. However, I got a dream assignment to be an assistant army attache in Moscow. So um, I was the first woman at a Shea and it was a post-Cold War environment because now you just had Russia um, and all these other republics that had turned into countries. Uh, they, um, it was a little easier to work there in that, for example, we as attachés didn't have to ask permission to go visit other parts of Russia, but we had to tell them we were going. So we were being followed a lot. There was still a lot of distrust and the Russians by and large were not exactly, they did not a, um, approach our cooperation with open arms. There was a lot of resistance still on their part, but we did what we could. I viewed this time as an opportunity to begin to understand each other. It was a time of hope. Unfortunately, that too has not panned out. Um, this happened about a few months after I got to Moscow. Yeltsin and his parliament had a little disagreement. That's the parliament building after shots were fired. Marine Attaché and I were sent out to go see what was happening in Moscow. That's one of the street scenes that we picked up on. I was also there for the 50th anniversary of the Great Patriotic War, which is what the Soviet Union Russia calls uh, World War II. It was a huge event. Uh, Yel um, uh, President Clinton was there, uh, many, many dignitaries, lots of events going on. My role in all of this was coordinating veterans um, events. We had a contingent of about 15 with the American Legion come. Uh, veterans from every country that participated in the war came to include Germany. Um, on the left you see there were all kinds of events all over the place. Uh, everyone who had served pretty much was walking around in their uniforms. These are two Russian veterans with their medals and all. Um, one of my jobs was to coordinate with the Moscow National Veterans, Associ uh, Veterans Organization in Russia. And I worked with the gentleman that's standing to my right. <laughs> um, he was the deputy, the, the fellow to my left is his boss, Then they, they were the Moscow Veterans Group. Um, when I brought the invitations, this is a picture taken at uh, um, Ambassador Pickering did a reception at Spasso House at his residence and invited a, a whole bunch of um, veterans. When I took the invitations to them, the deputy said, oh, my boss isn't gonna come, he hates Americans. I said, and nevertheless, here's his, <laughs> here's his invitation, it's his choice, he's getting the invitation. A few weeks after this, I got a bunch of photos that were take, had been taken that evening and I went to give them some. The deputy says, I gotta tell you, when we got back, 
my boss told me, what a waste these last 50 years have been. And that just goes to show you the you know, person to person contact, not necessarily at the highest levels, but at us and regular, regular people, because that changed 50 years of his dislike, to put it mildly, of Americans. Uh, and to the right is Polish, <laughs> Polish veterans. They insisted on a, on a photo with me. And uh, one other thing I wanted to say about all the veterans that I talked to during these few days is that they all gave the same message, and that was their hope that their sacrifices would mean that their grandchildren wouldn't have to have the same sacrifices. Another um, hope unfulfilled in some parts of the world, unfortunately. Uh, another thing I got to do, um, is everyone familiar with cutting? Anyone not familiar with cutting? Well, briefly, um, about 22,000 Polish officers and intelligentsia, Polish intelligentsia, were basically massacred um, in Katyn and a few other locations. Initially, uh, the site was discovered by German, uh, no, by, well, anyway, it was first blamed on the Germans. The Soviets blamed it on the Germans. But uh, years later, it came to um, be proven that it was really Soviet forces that did the massacring. And I got to go to Katyn when the ground was being consecrated in preparation for creating a, um, a memorial cemetery there. Our defense attaché, knowing I was Polish, he got an invitation. He said, why don't you go? It was uh, very, very moving. There were all kinds of dignitaries that came. This is a photo I took. I'm not a great photographer, but there's Wałęsa as, as one example. Uh, it was a very moving time, and those are other attachés that were with me. The uh, Polish attaché was attaché was a little upfront and personal there, but we knew we did know we did know each other. Excuse me. One more story about this is that my parents happened to be in Poland at this time, and they were watching TV. They were at a spa. They were watching TV in, in a room of other people. I, Polish TV was showing this when they. I guess the camera spanned and, and I appeared on the TV. My dad and mom went ballistic. <laughs> uh, I, I am to this day very happy I was able to give them that joy. Okay. I did get promoted in Moscow to Colonel, much to my surprise, maybe a whole bunch of other people's surprise. I show this just um, to say that you know the saying, when in Rome? All right. So I had just gotten promoted, the DCM and our defense attache there, they promoted me. And of course, being in Moscow, we had to have a toast. That's not the usual protocol for promotions that you get pinned and then you have some vodka, but we did that. And then a good time was had afterwards. And yes, mom and dad visited. Uh, in Russia, and also they came to visit me in Ukraine. The only place no one ever visited me was Kansas. I wonder why. So from there, I went to Ukraine. Now, the Ukrainians were welcoming of any and all. I mean, there were some little exceptions. We call them din dinosaurs that were still left in the Cold War. But by and large, the Ukrainians were very welcoming of exchanges, of learning, um, of seeing how we do things. And it was a whole different atmosphere um, in Ukraine. We had a lot of uh, military bilateral exchanges. That was one of my jobs to arrange those, bringing Ukrainians to the United States. And we had all kinds of uh, our troops coming uh, to Ukraine. Uh, a, lot, a, bu a busy, busy time. The other part, main part of um, my job was to organize peacekeeping exercises in Yavoriv training area, which is north of Lviv. It got bombed in the most recent war. Um, we did a whole series of peacekeeping exercises. The Ukrainians really wanted to learn how to do that. Um, and so that we did it. We did three of them. The first was the United States and Ukraine. The second was Warsaw Pact countries and Ukraine. And the third was a full level NATO exercise uh, with all NATO countries participating. I must say that the third um, peacekeeping, both the lead up and everything to it, was a diplomatic challenge for me because 
nothing against a Greek people, but the Greeks were put in charge. And if the Greeks didn't come to me one day complaining about what the Ukrainians were doing, the Ukrainians were coming to me <laughs> complaining about what the Greeks were doing. They came in a little heavy handed, assuming that the Ukrainians didn't know very much about that, but they had already done a whole bunch of exercises. Nevertheless, it happened, everything went well. Uh, we had all kinds of dignitaries come for that. Uh, of course, we had to start with a parade, and I just selected three shots, Polish flag, Ukrainian flag, and our United States flag. <clears throat> this is uh, a picture of me and the guys <laughs> at the Yavorif Training Center. The gentleman to my right was the general I dealt with a lot on many, many issues to include paying to have the site improved to our standards. One funny story, we brought them to the United States to one of our bases. They stayed in the BOQ. We have televisions in every BOQ. When I got back there, they on, on their list of things that needed to be done and paid for was TVs in every room of officers' quarters. And I went, no, guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, can't, I can't approve that. I was approving the budget. I said, no, no, I don't want to go to jail. I can't be doing, I can't be doing that. And, and we always, th these are some of the ladies that were there, uh, just the picture of me and the ladies who did a lot of the cooking and, and the, the um, cleaning there. Other duties, um, we had an attache association. I was the vice president. Every year we threw an annual attache ball. That's the picture. Um, the guy in the middle is the um, chief of, of the joint staff of the Ukrainian forces. And down on the bottom is me talking to the chief of the um, airborne, Ukrainian airborne forces. He was a very interesting person. Um, we, we talked, of course, business, but we had so many philosophical discussions with him. He was a very deep person. And I don't know what the heck we're talking about there, but we were, but we were talking. <laughs> and this is the team. Um, I, you have, as an attache, uh, many entertaining responsibilities. This is Sveta and Anton. Um, we're all a little younger there. Um, Sveta did a lot of house cleaning and some cooking for me. Anton did all kinds of things for me. I couldn't have done it without them. They are still in Ukraine. Sveta married and built a house outside of Kiev. I visited in 2018 and got to reconnect. I'm still in touch. Sveta had a house built um, outside of Kiev. Um, they left for a while because the house next to them got bombed. Their house lost all their windows. Uh, Anton became a lawyer. Uh, he is still practicing in Kiev. They're doing a lot by Zoom. And many a day when they can't continue because nowadays the electricity is out, so it's very, very difficult. But they're keeping up good spirits. Uh, um, Sveta and her husband are now uh, working for, I forget the name of the organization, delivering all kinds of goods into Ukraine. Um, and, you know, hopefully they'll have life back to normal. The people in, in Ukraine, I know in Kyiv, I'm told, are trying to have some sense of normalcy despite everything, so many things are still continuing as best, as best they can. All right, so then I retired. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I really grew to love Ukraine and its people while I was there. Who knew that I would end up in Jaffrey? Who knew that I would become, as Joe said, um, an interfaith minister and a chaplain? None of that uh, was in the plan. I didn't have time to plan my retirement. So I show this picture of a mandala because I want to share a funny story. Um, I went to Hartford Seminary. I just I kind of stumbled into that. And the first course I attended was the Women's Leadership Institute. I figured I knew enough about leadership, but they were talking about feminist spirituality, so I wanted to learn about that. And the very first class that I went to, I stopped dead in my tracks before go at the threshold of the classroom, where a mandala was on the floor, candles, other artifacts. I had recently retired. I was not a touchy-feely person. <laughs> And, but I said, no, 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 you're going to do this. You're going to go in. And so I did. And I'm very, very grateful for that experience. I ended up um, getting a degree in spirituality and then um, going a few years later to a Tree of Life Interfaith Temple and got ordained there as an interfaith minister. So it, it has been a gift. How I got to Jaffrey, 
trying to make this short. I've, um, several years before, sort of, sort of in the early 80s, George, correct me if I'm wrong, mom and dad bought uh, two plots of land somewhere around Crestview, it was the middle of the woods then. George calls me one day and says, hey, um, mom and dad are buying this land in Jaffrey. I said, what the heck is Jaffrey? What's New Hampshire? I said, okay, you want to buy the lot next to them? I said, yeah, sure. So we did, and we held on to it for a number of years. Uh, and then mom put her foot down and prevailed because she told my dad, yeah, you want to retire there? I'll come visit you. So we ended up, <laughs> so we ended up selling the land. And then when I retired, a friend and I went camping across the states in Canada, and we ended up in Greenfield on my way to my brothers at, in Hampstead at the time, so brothers and, and Sandy. Um, and I got a map, and I went, ah, oh, Jaffrey, we were in Greenfield. I said, well, this is where Jaffrey was. No kidding. So um, one thing led to another. I had not planned anything for my retirement. I had a townhouse in Washington, D.C. I knew I couldn't go back to that rat race. And, and I could have, but I didn't want to. Um, so started looking around. Long story short, I ended up renting in Jaffrey and then having a house built where I've been living for over 20 years on Ingalls Road. And I am very, very grateful for having landed here. So as a chaplain, I, I worked uh, ten year, roughly 10 years for hospice at HCS. I worked at a nursing home down in Massachusetts. I worked, um, or, and I volunteered at a few nursing homes around here and at a hospital down in Massachusetts for a number of years. Um, and I want to share some lessons. That's all I'm going to say about that. But I want to share some lessons from my times as a chaplain. Blessings work both ways. If I'm a blessing, you know, oh, thank you, thank you, you're a blessing to me. Uh, it's very, very important to listen, listen deeply not put yourself into their story. It's very important, I think, to go with the flow. And we are all in this together. We are also very, very connected. Um, and those are lessons that I am grateful for from my time as, as a chaplain. And those lessons came in very handy when I went to Poland. So I went for the first time last March. <clears throat> and <clears throat> Excuse me. I just wanted to show you, give you a little orientation. I fly into Warsaw, uh, then I go down to Lublin. It's about a two-hour train ride and roughly the same amount of time driving. Um, a little southeast, closer to the border from Lublin is Zamość, another place I visit. And then um, so more east towards the border, uh, directly maybe from Lublin is Kanivola, a little the little village I first visited. Uh, so that's where I'm focused. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> when the war started, I really, I felt it was a visceral feeling. I had to do something besides write checks. Um, I started looking into organizations. I reached dead ends all over the place. Um, and then there's a young man, Peter, who lived with me for about a year. He's originally from Poland. He served in the Polish army, and he actually served with our forces in Iraq. He came to visit an uncle, and anyway, that's another story, but he ended up living with me after he got out of the army. He's now doing well in England, and he's got tons of connections. So I called him. I said, Peter, you have any suggestions on how, what I might do if I go to Poland, how I might connect? And he said, well, as a matter of fact, my mom and sister are um, in the small village of Kanivola, and they're helping refugees. They've been helping from almost day one. So why don't you go there? I'll, I'll call them, and you can stay with them and see. So I said, okay, that works. And he says, my best buddy, Pavel, lives in Lublin, and he'll pick you up and take you there. I said, okay, sounds like the, a plan. <laughs> um, I remain to this day very touched as word got out that I was going to go to Poland. So many people thr literally thrust money into my hands. I went to Poland um, with about five, six thousand dollars plus money that I brought with me. <clears throat> and I am eternally grateful for all of you uh, who have done that. Um, many small people in many small places. Okay. So. This was my first trip. These are the dates. 
Um, that first time that I was there, it was a bit chaotic as far as the refugees were concerned. Uh, people were trying to help all over the place, <clears throat> showing their support. Uh, to the left <clears throat> is what, when I walked into the Marriott, I stay at the Marriott right across from the airport to recover from the trip before I do anything else. Um, and this is, it says, um, we are in solidarity with Ukraine. I took the train that first time from Lublin to Warsaw. Every, I don't know if you can see it. Oh, how does this thing work? <laughs> yeah, up on front of this engine uh, that were Polish and Ukrainian flags. Every engine that came through that station had Polish and Ukrainian flags on it. This is uh, a couple pictures from Kanivola. <clears throat> uh, this is a little uh, a village of about a thousand people out in the lake region. You know, kind of, hey, there's, a, there's another circle. They're lake, a they're lake region, and we're a lake region. This is a little store that they have there. Um, and this to the right is the building where they put up about 40 women and children, refugees from Ukraine. They were already there when I arrived. <clears throat> So when I got there, I stayed with Peter's mom, Vasha, uh, slept on her couch, it was a very comfortable couch. They have small apartments there. Um, and I was introduced to some of the women uh, who were refugees there, started talking to them, uh, got to know what their needs were and started helping with the funds that I had received. I show this picture because when I left Canivolo the first time, coming out of the apartment building where I was staying, there was this beautiful rainbow. You can take it for what, what you want. <laughs> you can interpret it for what you want, but I really uh, was moved by this rainbow appearing. From there, I went to Lublin, um, and these are just a couple photos. This is their town hall. Uh, again, a big, huge sign, or town hall, it's a city, <laughs> so a city hall. Uh, we are in solidarity, Lublin is in solidarity with Ukraine. Uh, this is in their pedestrian zone, the pedestrian area. Um, the, right, the sign to the right says, do you need help? And gives you information on where to find it. And not to mention they'll scan things now. They're very up, very up to date uh, on that. To the left is the Rosmarin restaurant. Some of you may, may know that history. Um, I was walking through their pedestrian area. It's very well, it's very worth visiting. Um, and saw this sign on the bottom there, um, here. And that basically said, we support Ukrainians and we offer free lunches for Ukrainians. So I was intrigued because I was looking for places to support. So I walked in there and one of the owners was there. We got to talking. I left him some money. I must have told someone back home that this had happened because next thing I know, Suze and Ken Campbell got in the picture and they were planning the annual... Um, dinner, correct me if I'm wrong, not there, annual dinner for the JCVIS and created a fundraiser and collected, I believe it was close to around $1,500, which I was able the day before I left to take back to the two owners. They were stunned, uh, very, very grateful and ended up with, with some of that money um, doing, it was coming up Orthodox Easter. So they did a special meal Ukrainian refugees for Orthodox Easter uh, with that money. And my friend and neighbor Karen was able to take the money, put it into my account that I had here, so I was able to draw that money. Anyway, so that's how it flowed. It was a whole series of connections. One person knew, told me, I went to check it out. Sometimes it panned out, sometimes it didn't. It was just sort of following a trail of one connection to another. I thought I would go there, maybe help interpret it, <clears throat> help interpret or uh, serve food, uh, I was really surprised by ending up coordinating all of this support effort. Oops, wrong one. <laughs> Zamosht, just um, again, word of mouth. Someone told me about a woman, Stefania and her husband, who from day one were helping refugees. They had set up a not-for-profit called La Pigua. Um, they had refugees in their home. Uh, ultimately, they cooperated with the woman who ran the wedding venue in Zamosht. And they put up Ukrainian refugees in the wedding venue. That just says it's a point for, um, we, can, we can help here. 
Uh, the wedding venue had rooms upstairs, which worked out ideally, and downstairs in the huge celebration hall, they had corners, you know, here's clothing, here's toys for children, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so that was Zamosh. Went back to Canivola, we ended up getting a bunch of stuff to make their lives a little bit better. We got a basketball hoop and a basketball even for, for the kids. Um, we got them um, you know, a, a number of things to help ease their life uh, there. To the left is, this was I think after I left, I got this picture from Marcin and his wife Magda. Ah yes, Marcin and Magda. Marcin is my driver and team member in Poland, in Lublin. Uh, we'll see a picture later. He, um, he, he's a wonderful guy and he and Magda, while I'm gone, are able to do things there. Um, how I found, quote unquote, Marcin, I took Pavel and his wife out to dinner to thank him for driving me around and I had realized by then it would have been very helpful to have some dedicated transportation. I didn't want to rent a car and try to figure out the roads all by myself. And at that dinner, totally unsolicited, Pavel goes, well, you know, I have a brother-in-law, his wife is his sister, I have a brother-in-law who's a taxi driver and he'd be really happy to drive you around. I said, you have got to be kidding me. So um, the next day we met and ever since then he's, um, he's been helping. How he's been helping? Well, before I left Poland with Pavel's help, I set up a Polish bank account with a, US, uh, with a dollar account and also a um, Zwote account. We can transfer money in, from here to there in dollars. I can go online and switch that into Zwote. Uh, Marcin, whom I trust uh, 100%, 150%, and his uh, and Pavel have ATM cards, and they can draw Zwote from ATM machines as things come up. They can continue doing things in Poland when I'm not there. So after I left that first time, Marcin and just when spring was breaking out, Marcin and Magda and their dog Marlon, yes, after Marlon Brando, <laughs> yes, as, as after Marlon Brando. They went back there and, you know, just the kids, the, one of the, some of the mothers said, you know, this is the first time that the kids really were able to just have a blast. And they did that day when they brought uh, Marlon. That's just what they do. Okay. Before I left the first time, we took uh, the Ukrainians uh, food shopping because up to that point, they, they were getting a lot of staples, packaged food, some food for a restaurant, but they were really longing for fresh fruit and vegetables, primarily, they said, for their children. So we took them to the store. This is the result on the left. Um, and Marcin continued doing that as long as they were there. Um, about every month or so, he took them uh, shopping using the ATM card after I left. To the right um, is clothing that he was able to get for them. The Ukrainians all arrived who went through clothing. clothing. Suddenly spring is here. Uh, he coordinated with the ladies and got uh, summer clothing for everybody from secondhand stores. That was a lot of effort. There is no overhead in this operation other than paying Marcin for his, um, for his fuel. Because he's there, he works as a cab, as a cab driver. This is Marcin and Magda and Marlon. This is, I think, yeah, during my last visit, I took this, I took this picture. Marcin, we joke that he could be my bodyguard. <laughs> he's got tattoos all over. Um, he's got a heart of gold. He was driving from the beginning. Ukrainians, if they arrived in Lublin with maybe an address scratched on a piece of paper, he drove them there without charging them. Um, that's just what he does. Um, one funny story, I was driving with him we were in, stuck in traffic, I, I think it was Lublin, and he had, it suddenly he realized he needed to take an exit. So he's like, kind of cut someone off, this guy, fellow next to us, he cut him off. And I was sitting in the passenger seat and I look over and this guy is mad. <laughs> and he rolls down his window and Marcin rolls down you know, his window and I'm watching all of this and you could see the guy's mad, ready to, ex ready to explode. He takes one look at Marcin and he goes, uh-huh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and Martin, he was apologetic. He said, "Oh, I'm so sorry, but I, yeah, okay, it's okay, it's okay." So anyway, that's um, that's them. 
So this is the system that we're working in. When I came back the first time, uh, the first church in Jaffrey, Steve Miller, uh, who's the pastor there, um, was very, uh, first church was very wanting to support. And so what we've done, for those of you who may not know, is set up a, a separate account from all other um, accounts that the church may have, uh, where any donations are deposited into that account. And that's what we then do and send over to Poland. This is my second trip, uh, the dates. I revisited, well, you can read that yourself. I need a drink of water. So why don't you go ahead and read that? <laughs> I, need, I need a drink of my water. <laughs> so <clears throat> Domatki is a place in Warsaw that focuses on women with very small children. Of course, there are a few older children who have multiple children. They've had a few births, as a matter of fact, since uh, the refugees arrived there. Edison School is a private school in Warsaw, uh, which we were supporting in the interim. All of this is someone knew that I was there, said, hey, can you check this out? It, it, it just all happened. I met with Natalia. That was another fair that Marcin had picked up uh, in the interim. She has three children. Uh, we did a lot to help her while she was in Poland um, with the three kids. I actually uh, interviewed her. She was willing for an interview. I wrote her uh, story, her life story, in one of the um, ledger transcript articles that I did. She has since returned to Ukraine. She wanted to return. We kept in touch, but we've unfortunately lost contact with her. And then I've had meetings from the first trip throughout with a man called Lukas. Uh, he goes into Ukraine on a regular basis, doing all kinds of things, helping women who've been raped, bringing supplies in. He's got all kinds of connections um, within Ukraine. This is just a picture, Kanivala farewell. When I ba went back the second time, uh, the Ukrainians had been told they were gonna need to move out of the building because the community needed it to house summer vacationers. That's what they do there. Um, most of them went back. Uh, with a few exceptions, I met this time with some uh, that were still there. There were a few more that were still there. Uh, that's a ping pong table we also we also bought. And one of the things, one of my missions in going back was to bring uh, messages from First Church in Jaffrey. Uh, what on, on the right you see what I brought back. Uh, people in at First Church wrote messages to the Ukrainians there in Kanivola. Um, I translated everything for the people, and it was also a very moving thing. I think it was the lady on the on the left. Uh, there were tears in their eyes, and they and she said, "It's very important to have food for the soul as well as food for the body." So it was a very very moving. They much appreciated the messages that had been sent. This is uh, just a couple pictures of Domatki in Warsaw. It's on a quiet, sort of quiet ro dirt road, a uh, big fence all around it. <clears throat> this is the Edison School uh, that we supported. They, um, they did a wonderful job. It's a private school. They did a wonderful job setting things up for the Ukrainians. Uh, they also had to ask them to move shortly after I visited because they needed that space back for the next school year, but they took pains to find everyone a place to live if they if they were going to be staying. How we helped them, the, ch the Ukrainian children who attended the school, uh, especially the older kids, I think there are about 14 Ukrainian kids. The At the end of the school year, the kid, those kids in that age group get to go on a, to some kind of camp, uh, end of school camp up in towards uh, the ocean, at the ocean. And they didn't have enough money to send the Ukrainian children. They didn't want, want them to be left behind, feel they were different. So we were able to support them and send all the Ukrainian kids. Um, the mothers were very thankful. Okay, did I cover? Yes, I did. All right, so this is my third visit, more recent. Again, I, I went back to Domatki. They did, a, in, in the interim, they did a lot of uh, housekeeping, a lot of reorganizing, regrouping. Uh, the brackets uh, opened the gates for us when Marcin and I arrived. Before they, before I left for Poland and they had a trip to Poland, they said they had some free time. They asked if there was a place that they might volunteer, so connected them with that. 
uh, Don Matki, they did a lot of good over there while they were there, but you know, we arrived and who opens the door for Machin and me? It's uh, Pauline and Steve, that was kind of cool. Uh, so I also met with Lukash again. Uh, Liljova 5 is another place we're, we're now supporting. Uh, learned of this from Connection in Zamosh, went to check it out. Actually, I asked Marcin to go check it out because I was here at the time. He, uh, he connected with Victoria and was started helping them also um, buying things that they needed. Initially, they needed a whole bunch of diapers. This is a place um, in Lublin, uh, also about 30 to 40 people. There are about seven, I think it is, autistic children, one blind boy there um and so we started helping them once martin checked it out and said yes let's let's help them so i went there and met with um this time when, on my trip i met with victoria who herself is a ukrainian and she um feels it's her mission to stay there and help these people who are there she speaks polish which is which is very helpful and part-time she works at anyone want to guess Bingo! <laughs> she works part time at McDonald's. Lovely young, lovely young lady. <laughs> um, all right. So, oh wait a minute. Can I go back? Yeah. So I, I revisited Zamost and they have and their distribution center. And at the end, I'll talk to us about this. There was a concert that I was very, very lucky to attend. This is uh, Lilova 5, this is what's hanging when you walk in. It's a big house by our, by Polish standards. Um, even by our standards, it's a big house. The story there is the Polish woman who owns it. When the refugee crisis happened, she moved out, turned the whole house into a residence for Ukrainians there. At the early stages, there were 100 Ukrainians who were staying there. Right now, as I said, I can't remember exactly, I think there are between 30 and 40. Um, people who are who are staying there. She herself is still living in some other apartment and the house is still available for Ukrainians. This is the distribution point in Zamosh run by a Pani Bozenka and you do not want to cross Pani Bozenka. She is about this tall. Ball of Fire um, runs that place with the help of some Ukrainian women. Um, they have anything from clothing to cleaning supplies to food to um, like, you know, aspirin, things like of that nature, daily needs things. Um, a funny story there, Pani Bozenka said they don't turn anything away shortly before we got there. They had received a whole bunch of cases of pesto. Pesto is not in the daily diet usually of Polish and Ukrainian cuisine. Uh, but she said, we don't turn anything away, but would you mind taking some of this off our hands? So we loaded up the car before we left with a whole bunch of cases of pesto and took it to Liljova 5 uh, the next day or whenever. Uh, and they said, we'll use it, we'll use it, no problem. So we were able to share um, to share the pesto <laughs> with that. With the <clears throat> okay, the concert. <clears throat> So I wasn't supposed to be at this concert. This is a, another one of those things that wasn't planned. Um, I was actually supposed to be in Warsaw waiting for my very early morning flight back to the States. However, um, Delta canceled my return flight about a week before <laughs> I was due to uh, come go to Poland. And uh, there's another story there, but ultimately I ended up coming back getting a flight a day later. So I was still in Lublin when this concert happened. And Pavel, by also, I won't go into all the details, but by another fluke, uh, was someplace where there was a guy that was offering tickets to this concert, which, which took place at one of the Lublin's universities. It's known for its universities in, in an auditorium in Lublin. Uh, so he asked if I wanted to go, and I said, uh, well, yes, absolutely, I would love to go. This was the opening scene. Now, this concert was put on by Ukrainian refugees to thank their Lublin hosts for doing what they were doing for them.
This is a group of children. Now, the concert included lots of music, anywhere from rock, hard rock, to folk songs, to uh, various musical instruments, to some poetry, all kinds of music. And this group of children, unfortunately, we can't play this for you today, but they sang a Polish folk song. In, it might also be a Ukrainian one, but I grew up with this folk song, so I knew it. And they went ahead and sang it. It was touching. There was not a dry, I don't think, there was a dry eye in the audience. It was mostly Ukrainians and Poles. I might have been the only American, I don't know. Uh, but everyone, it was such a moving thing, which is why I'm so grateful that I was able to attend. Thank you, Delta, for canceling. <laughs> Thank you, Delta, for canceling my, uh, my flight. So intermingled with uh, the music of various kinds, really some talented uh, individuals, some amateurs, but really there were some talented artists performing. Um, but there were also stories being told. And I'd like to share two stories. One, I think it's this late, this young lady who told the story. Um, and they had all kinds of slides up there too. Um, her story was, she had to leave really, really quickly because they were bombing. She grabbed her pa backpack, she said, stuffed it with whatever, and left. Uh, and then her journey led her to Lublin. And she said that along the way of her journey, she realized that it's not important what you have in terms of goods. It's important what you have inside. And that home is where your heart is. Now, a young lady came to that conclusion. Uh, it's a good lesson, I think, for all of us. The other story is a, a mother told about her and she had a teenage daughter. And they too had to leave in a hurry. And the mo mother's yelling at the daughter, grab, grab what, you know, just one or two things and let's go. And the daughter grabbed a violin, her violin, and she played that violin that evening. So... So I'm, I'm almost done. So when I before I started um, preparing for this, I, I wasn't sure how the heck I was going to talk this long. But once I started, I said, oh, my God, they're going to pull me away with, uh, with one of those hooks. I think this was the last song, but it was towards the end. Uh, it's a song. Actually, the title of the song is Oh, Strange Is This World. It was sung, it was a big hit in Poland in the 1970s, sung by um, Czesław Niemann. And when you can see, can you all read the words? Okay, you don't need to hear me drone on then, okay. So when you consider these words, they were sung, they were written in the 1970s in the depths of the communist era. There's another layer here of, of meaning of this song. I like to just read the last verse, but most people are of goodwill. <clears throat> I, thanks to them, believe that this world should never, never die. And now the time has come, the final time, for hatred, for hatred to destroy itself. Now, when a woman with a marvelous voice started singing the song, the audience went crazy. I, of course, did have no idea what this song, what this song signified, or you know what it meant. So I went, what, what? Um, uh, and I went with Pavel and his wife, and then uh, Marcin didn't go, but Magda did. I guess they only they only got f four tickets. Um, the crowd went absolutely wild. It was a very very moving moment, and I go back to what I started saying in the beginning, in that there are many many people of goodwill. Um, both in Poland and all over the place. And there needs to be a focus on, on these people of goodwill to listen to their stories, to show that there is another way than what is going on right now in, in Ukraine. So whom are we supporting now? Uh, we continue to support through the First Church Fund. Uh, I didn't wanna continue getting inundated with money <laughs> as I was going to Poland. So this fund has been very, very helpful in managing what we are supporting. We're supporting Domatki in Warsaw. 
Um, most recently, and Janet Grant um, is instrumental in this as the treasurer of the church. And so is um, uh, TD Bank, Brandon. They don't charge us for the you know, international transfer fees. He, uh, he helps uh, make all of this happen. Uh, <clears throat> most recently, we send, I think it was $1,000 to Dom Matkin, got an email back from the um, wonderful gal there, Anna. She's a very young Polish woman. She runs the operations there. They are not for profit. Um, she has a, like a little son that when we met with her this um, last time that we visited, um, she told us what they're doing, about the births coming up. Uh, she's very, very involved. And she's also made a point to say that all, one of their missions is for those uh, Ukrainians who want to stay in Poland, they want to help them get on their own two feet. And they've had, she told me a couple of stories where that they've had some success in that. So Anna, she wrote me an email and said, you, your timing couldn't have been better. Uh, we just, our basement was just flooded. We lost a bunch of stuff that we had stored there and we need to make re, uh, repairs. With Liliova 5 in Lublin, we um, also support them. Uh, really, Marcin does that. Uh, he um, takes, he still goes shopping, buys, coordinates with Victoria, makes a list of what they need, uses the magical ATM card and, and goes ahead and delivers. So he does a lot of legwork for our team effort. Um, I, I wonder, do I have time? I don't know where I am. And I, I don't want to keep you all, but some of you got handouts. Uh, I don't think we had enough for everybody that's here. It does list at the end if you are, well, anyway, but it does tell the story of Daniel, the two-year-old blind boy, and I want to give Dr. Dmitry Tarasevich a round of applause because when I came back after meeting, the mother wanted help for the boy, talked to him. He contacted one of his colleagues who contacted someone else, who contacted someone else, who knew someone in Krakow. I'm now writing to the doctor in Krakow, sending him the documents the mother had that were translated. He sends those out to a number of specialists within Poland. Unfortunately, they all came back saying that there's nothing medically that can be done for the boy. He's got some nerve that's undeveloped. However, this doctor didn't stop there. He contacted the, a school for blind children in, um, in Lublin, full circle. So I started in Lublin, came back here, you know, path, whoa, well, it was a circle. All right, so then we'll back to Poland and then back up to Lublin. He's uh, supposed to start uh, school um, like in the next day or so there. So, um, all right, Zamosht, uh, Lapigoa, we're supporting there. We send via PayPal. And Lukas, the most recent uh, support that we gave him, he bought a whole bunch of winter clothing and took that into Ukraine. So we've been doing that. I'm not sure there's a dry eye in this place. Do we have people online, Ed? Uh, yes, we have. All right, well, to those of you who are participating remotely, if you have a question or a comment, please use the chat line. And yes, would you, uh, just a second, let me, okay. Okay. Lona, did you, I, I mean, we know each other for quite a while, we live a few doors down. The questions that come to me, uh, uh, first of all, incredibly, and I'm sure I speak for others, moved by the whole story. The whole story needed to be told, like you said, full circle. Two things. One, uh, this is a small community. We're 60, 70 people here today, and you're one person carrying this water. There are many other towns in the Mananak region to say nothing about our country. I want you to comment, and then I'll give you a second question, about what's being done uh, nationwide and within the region. I, uh, I can't begin to elaborate on all of that. I mean, I know, if, like I said in the beginning, there are many other people will doing many, many other things. Uh, I know in, in Kiev, for example, uh, there's a mother and daughter who've been sponsored from from Ukraine, a family sponsored them. They're in Keene right now. Um, I think the Lions Club is doing something. Um, 
there are there are a number of efforts going on in the Monadnock region. Uh, there's a I know there's someone in Harrisville who is doing that. There's a person in Wilton. I hope to connect with these two people shortly. Oh, good. Uh, there, they've also engaged. I'm not exactly sure how there have been people who've been sponsored uh, within in New Hampshire. I know there's organizations that are doing that. Uh, so yes, so yes, that's why I say many small people in many small places, and I'm just one of those small. And the second question is the trend toward both politically and is the one I'm sorry the trend oh. toward uh, less support for Ukraine, both politically and perhaps the war weariness where we're we as individuals are not supporting them. And I'd love to have your comments. Well, Thank as you. as I think my slides showed, the first visit was chaotic. The second, things had stabilized, and the third, the overall overarching message was that support was dwindling within Poland. Um, a number of organizations had pulled out of Poland. Um, the need was still there. And the um, everyone told me this. Wherever I visited, they said that, you know, we're not getting the support that we did initially when the influx came into Poland. And they're trying to figure it out. You know, how can we continue supporting for those who don't go back, um, those who want to stay? Um, it's not easy, and the Polish people themselves have, um, you know, higher inflation than we do. Gasoline, I think, for them a gallon, I reckon, <laughs> my my arithmetic is good. Not my strong point. France can probably connect, correct me. I think it's like eight dollars a gallon. You know, they pay by the liter, so they have their own struggles and issues. Um, but guys like Marcin and Magda, they're you know helping out. To be honest, we couldn't couldn't continue doing this work, I don't think, without Martin and Magda filling in between the gaps um, and, and doing what they're doing. Um, I don't think I need this. But anyway, uh, my question is, is there any kind of national organization put together as a relief group for uh, Ukraine, or is this all done sort of local basis like you're doing? I, I'm not sure, Charlie. Um, I think there might be, and then there are some large organizations still doing like refugee support, and there are, there are support groups for Ukraine. I have a couple that I still keep getting messages from online. I'm trying to remember at the moment what exactly they're called. So I think so, uh, but there's a lot of you know low level from the ground up initiatives. Good. I think if you go to the that's all. Yeah, the folks on. If you go to the State Department website, state.gov, you'll find something there that'll help you figure out groups you can go through to help in in Ukraine anyway. I don't know about Poland. Just so we don't forget, here in Jeffrey, the Paul Revere Bell at the United Church down the street rings at 4.30 every Thursday, marking the beginning of that war. And last Thursday, 12 times for those 12 months. And, and I do want to say that local organizations here within Jaffe, to include the United Church, have made a uh, significant contribution. So most of the people we saw were women. I assume their husbands are fighting. And, Most, yeah. and so many of them will end up having to stay in Poland. Is that, I mean, is that true that uh, most of their husbands are at war? And are there lots of widows in Poland at this point? Uh, I don't have statistics, but just from, you know, anecdotal, most of the women in Kanivola, their husbands had to stay um, in Ukraine. The only exceptions are uh, fathers with, I think, three children. They can leave. One of the women in Kanivola, her husband was already in, um, well, in Poland, but he drove uh, TIR trucks, those big, huge trucks, all over Europe. And so he stayed there. He was able to visit every so often when he wasn't working, and he continued to work to support. Uh, actually, that family is now in Chicago. We're in touch. Um, 
So but the Natalia, uh, she didn't have a husband. She had divorced. Um, I, I don't I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, it, it's their choice. Like I said, the second time I went back, a lot of Ukrainians had gone back already. Um, that's home. Uh, one of the women in Carnivola said, "My department, my apartment was destroyed, but I'm going to go live with my mother." Uh, there's movement back and forth. Some have gone back and then said, "Oh, I, I, we can't handle this, or everything's hopeless," and they left back into Poland or, or wherever they went. So there's a lot of cross coming and going too. My second question is, as opposed to Afga the Afghan people, who we opened the doors when we left Afghanistan. My understanding is that the Ukrainians need a sponsor mm -hmm. here before they can come. Is that true? Yes. Um, those that don't have families here have to have a sponsor. There's um, a program specifically for Ukrainians, but also uh, lately it includes a few other countries. It's a program where they can find refuge here in the United States and they're guaranteed they can stay at least two years. Uh, they can apply while they're here for asylum more long term. There's no guarantee. They're not promised that they're going to get it. Uh, but in the interim, they can they can certainly apply there. They have authority to work here. They can send their kids to school. They can get some level of support. But really, the sponsor is um, the one that should be uh, giving them the help that they need initially. We'll just say that I'm involved with the Afghan family yeah. in Keene. Yeah. And the mother of that family was, ta was taking care of a Ukrainian mother's baby so the Ukrainian mother could go back to work. Wow. And it was a gift to both. Yeah. I imagine. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. That's lovely. Yeah. Mm. Thank you all for coming for this extraordinary hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I hope you will remain, chat with Ilona, enjoy the treats. I want to thank Ed Watazek for once again handling the audio video, which I think ran seamlessly. I want to say to you, alone of that this has been an extraordinary treat and as I was listening to you and thinking about it the word competence came to my mind and I'm not going to try to define the word but I know it when I see it we have an ex example of extraordinary competence and we're lucky you landed in Jaffa. I thank my lucky stars also. <laughs> thank you again. Thanks, Ed. One, one last, one last, one last comment. These uh, colors have become familiar to all of us, and we saw the Ukrainian flag in several slots. By the way, I have made a living asking stupid questions, and I asked the stupid question when I spoke with Alona a few days ago, who's paying for you to do all this? And of course the answer was, I am. And uh, such generosity of spirit is quite extraordinary. So we are not a, we're just here to hear stories. But today is an exception. I'm going to put this bowl in the back of the room. And, well, we have two of them. Oh. Well, <laughs> Ilona asked me, or I asked her, and she said, well, what do you think? And I said, yes, it's a good idea. So if any of us wishes to contribute, it's not going to her, it's going to Ukraine. I'm going to put it at the table in the back of the room. Thanks again for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much.
guess the next video is going to come out and it's so nice. Where's the table?